welcome everybody uh, to this new seminar of the One World Seminar Series in Cognitive Psychology. Today, I'm happy to welcome Dr. Malte Westman, who is leading the research group on dynamics of attention at the University of Lübeck in Germany. His research is multidisciplinary in the sense that he's working in psychology, neuroscience, and audiology, and he aims at understanding the interplay of neurocognitive mechanism involved in target enhancement and distraction suppression and to understand how they support goal-orienting behavior. For today's discussion, after the talk, Dr. Brooke McNamara will make the moderator, will do the moderation of this. So I thank you very much for joining us today. Day and I'm so pleased to hear your talk, Malti. Welcome again. Yes, thank you very much. Thanks for the kind introduction and thanks to the organizers for inviting me. So I will share my screen. Uh, so the talk today is entitled Attention, Please, Behavioral and Neural Dynamics of Distraction. And as the title says, I would like to mainly focus on the dynamics of distraction. And I will highlight in a minute on what I what I mean by distraction and what I mean by dynamics. So let's let's start with a with an everyday example of uh, of a busy scenery. So this is an example from the visual modality. And although I'm working mainly in the auditory domain, I start with an example here from the visual uh, modality. So you see a very busy visual scenery and there are many objects competing for our attention and as soon as we get a an instruction a cue or as soon as we have a goal uh, for example attend to the bird um, our attentional system will do something to uh, enhance the target or to dis uh, to suppress the distraction. So what I mean by that is that probably you found the bird in the upper left corner here. And uh, what happens internally in your brain or in your mind could be two different mechanisms by which selective attention might be implemented. And one of these mechanisms quite intuitively um, is target enhancement. So target enhancement means that all the features that belong to the target object, to the bird, are enhanced and the background is re left relatively unchanged. Another mechanism, an alternative mechanism, might be distractor suppression, which means that the target as such is left unchanged, but the distractors in the background fade out, they are suppressed. And of course, both of these mechanisms might also work in combination, so they might complement each other. And it's a very important topic of selective attention research in recent years to find out how these two mechanisms interact and how they shape the dynamics of attention across different modalities, visual modality, auditory modality, and others. So if we focus on a central question, uh, what is distraction? then we can uh, answer this question with a very simple and intuitive answer. Everyone knows what distraction is. Um, we are very often distracted during everyday life. Uh, distractors are all around us. Um, and also in, in experimental psychology, we have agreed on paradigms to study distraction. So I want to highlight two of these paradigms which are essential for uh, research on distraction. And these paradigms are individual modality, the additional singleton paradigm, where participants are presented with a number of objects on the screen. And there is one salient distractor, that would be the, the red item here. And um, there is another object, the circle, which is the target, and participants have to find it and report orientation of the line inside the circle. And on some trials, the salient distractor is present, and on other trials, it is absent. And if we contrast performance for trials with and without the distractor, we see a difference, right? Performance goes down for trials with a distractor, so that's a simple distraction effect. And actually, there are many adaptations of this paradigms, uh, of this kind of paradigm, which have shown um, that uh, this paradigm is very useful to study the dynamics of distraction in the visual modality. In the auditory modality, what I would like to focus on today mostly, uh, we usually use different kinds of paradigms. And one very popular paradigm is the so-called 
irrelevant sound task that we see here on the right. So the irrelevant sound task is in essence a working memory task. Participants listen to numbers. They have to uh, retain them in memory. And during memory retention, they are distracted by some irrelevant sound. Can be speech, can be, spe can be noise, can be anything. And in the end of a trial, they are presented with such a, a, an array of numbers and they have to pick the numbers in their order of presentation. It's a very challenging uh, task. And uh, if we manipulate the dynamics or the features of the distractor, um, we see that this affects uh, task performance and this is sought to manipulate distraction. So for example, in this study, the acoustic detail of the distractor was manipulated. The uh, uh, distractor increased in its spectral content and the more spectral detail the distractor had, the more distracting it was and the more performance was going down as to be expected, I guess. So today in this talk, as I said, I would like to focus on the dynamics of distraction. And a very important point I would like to make is that attention and distractor suppression are uh, processes that are not static, but very dynamic across several dimensions. And probably there are even more dimensions, but the most important dimensions for, for my research, I think, are these three, and I would like to highlight them. The first dimension is time. So as I will show later, attention and distractor suppression is dynamic across time. It is dynamic across space, which means that spatial cues can guide attention and space can be distrib or, or attention can be distributed in space. And a third very important dimension is individual differences, particularly when it comes to the subjective evaluation of distractors. So I think we all have experienced that distraction means something very different for different people, right? Something that uh, is distracting for one person is not necessarily distracting for another person. And these inter-individual differences need to be captured and need to be explained by models of attention. So these three dimensions basically map on the three parts of the talk. And in the first part of my talk, I would like to focus on the temporal dynamics of distractibility. So in 2020, we published a, a paper where, to be honest, I, I must admit, we, we found a purely exploratory, uh, or we, we conducted a purely exploratory analysis and found an effect that was quite surprising to us. Um, so we reanalyzed the data of um, such an irrelevant sound task or irrelevant speech task that I just highlighted in the beginning. Participants performed this memory task and they were distracted by speech items that were presented during the memory retention period. And there are usually two measures that we look at in this irrelevant sound task. And one is behavioral performance. So behavioral performance, if we plot that uh, over number position, uh, goes down and up again, which means there is a primacy and a recency effect. But for most analyses of the irrelevant sound task, we simply average across these number positions. Also, we can measure neural activity while participants perform this irrelevant sound task. And here you see um, the distractor evoked response in the electroencephalogram, so in the EEG. So we see the typical response components, P1, N1, P2. Uh, and this N1 component is the one we focused on in this study because this is supposed to reflect uh, the processing of the distractor. And in this exploratory analysis, what we looked at was how accuracy, so the performance in the task and the neural encoding of the distractor would be modulated by the temporal onset of the distractor. And when we plotted these two signals over distractor onsets, we found a very striking pattern, namely that the two signals were oscillating and they were oscillating in anti-phase. So what does it mean? Well, it means that there are certain points in time, for example, here after 1.3 seconds, if we present a distractor at this point in time, it is not very dis uh, it is very distracting because performance goes down very much and at the same time the neural response to this distractor is relatively strong at other points in time for example 1.5 seconds 
the distractor is not very distracting. If we present it here, performance does not go down very much and the neural encoding of the distractor is weaker, right? So these processes uh, alternate together. In order to capture these, these rhythmic modulations of accuracy and uh, neural encoding, we can perform spectral analyses. And you can see the empirical spectral analyses in these, in these blue and red lines. And the, the shaded background is uh, the spectral analyses or the, the, the spectral power that we get from, uh, from surrogate data where we shuffle the time axis. So basically anything that peaks out of this grayish, uh, of, of this background um, is significant. And we find that both accuracy and the periodic modulation of the neural encoding are modulated at frequencies between two to four hertz. And most importantly, also the joint manipulation of the two signals is um, manipulated or is, is, is oscillating, is cycling at two and a half hertz, right? So these two signals, uh, they, they, are, they are synced and uh, they oscillate together at a frequency of roughly two and a half hertz. So this was the first indication from this, this study that we got that maybe distractibility fluctuates rhythmically on a relatively fast time scale, on a sub-second time scale at roughly two and a half hertz. And actually this finding is reminiscent of attention fluctuations as they are found in the visual modality. So also in the visual modality, there is a lot of evidence from recent uh, years that attention is not deployed as a static resource, but it's fluctuating at frequencies between two to eight hertz. And here's uh, just a schematic figure summarizing this line of research. And very often in the visual modality, uh, a visual task is used where participants are cued on a screen to attend to one um, one position in a, in a, uh, on the screen. And after a variable delay, a target is shown either at this position or at another position. And the idea is that uh, neural activity in attention networks is fluctuating. And this surfaces as fluctuations in performance. So if we measure participants target detection performance, so how well they are able to detect this target, then we see rhythmic fluctuations on a sub-second time scale. Uh, and this is very often studied in the, in the visual modality. So later, um, our, our PhD student, our former PhD student, I must say, Troby Louis, she designed an experiment to replicate this effect and uh, to, to, to really develop a paradigm, an experimental paradigm that was really tailored to, uh, to finding this effect. So she used a, um, a task that was basically a pitch discrimination task. Participants discriminated the pitch of a first tone and a second tone. Participants just had to say whether the tones are same or different in pitch. But in between the two tones on 50% of trials, a distractor was played. So that was a fast sequence. Uh, 400 milliseconds, um, 25 hertz modulation of tones, and that was distracting. So we see that also in task performance, uh, as you see in this 45 degree plot, basically all or almost all participants fall below the diagonal. That means they performed worse when the distractor was present versus absent. And that is a very uh, important indication in, in these distraction paradigms. To, to find that, uh, that the distractor was indeed distracting. So that's the behavioral measure of, of distraction. And on the neural level, the distractor, because it had a 25 Hertz uh, modulation, it evoked a very nice 25 Hertz distractor evoked ERP uh, that you see in the lower right on the slide. So that was our neural measure of distractor processing. Very similar to the previous study where we also looked at performance and the N1. Here we look at sensitivity and the distractor evoked event-related potential. Again, we looked at how these two signals uh, would be manipulated or would be modulated by distractor onset time. And first of all, we found a, a relatively slow modulation over time that was due to very early and very late distractors 
um, having a very task detrimental effect. So in order to capture rather the, 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 the faster fluctuations in the signal, we regressed out the quadratic trend and we saw a similar picture as before, as in the study before. So you see that the behavioral performance and the distractor evoked uh, neural response, they oscillate more or less antiphasically, particularly in the beginning and in the end of this time interval, not so much in the middle. And most importantly, when we calculate the cross correlation between these two signals, so how much uh, they, they co-fluctuate, we do not find a flat line, but we find uh, some oscillations again in the slow frequency range. Very much as before, we can do spectral analyses and we find that all three of these uh, signals show significant modulations at different frequencies uh, between three and five hertz mostly. And what is very important, we can also do the very same analysis on trials without distractors. So 50% of the trials in this experiment are without distractors. And uh, that's a very important control condition where we can perform the same analysis on and show that in trials without distractors, these rhythmic effects are absent. So that's uh, that's a very important indication that it's not just a, a false positive we are seeing here, but it is a, as a veridical finding of, of rhythmic fluctuations in distractibility. So finally, um, we reasoned that if the human brain hosts an endogenous rhythm that is underlying distractibility, which our two studies are suggesting, then the neural state just prior to the onset of a distractor should explain or should determine how distracting the distractor is, right? And in the EEG, we can chase this effect. So we can basically perform a, a cluster analysis on the source level, so on the, on the level of individual voxels in the brain. And we can search for a cluster in time frequency uh, voxel space where brain regions show a significant relation between the phase of the neural oscillation in this brain region and performance in the task. All right. And we found such a such a cluster significant just before the onset of the distractor in the low frequency range centered uh, around three to four hertz. I think it was strongest in the three hertz frequency range. And we can see the, the location of this cluster here on the right on the brain surface. That's the, the black outline in left inferior frontal cortex. So in this brain region, um, Neural activity is fluctuating, and the fluctuation of this of the activity in this neural region is related to sensitivity. So when the distractor comes in at a certain point in time, at a certain phase uh, of, of this brain region, then uh, performance or, or distraction is high. And if it comes in at another phase, distraction is low, right? So we see this uh, relationship here uh, on the right side. Importantly, this region was distinct or different from the distractor evoked uh, auditory response, which we see in the white outline, right? So these two regions, they show some overlap, they are close to each other, but uh, the, the left inferior frontal cortex regions that showed this significant phasic modulation of sensitivity was different from uh, the hotspot of distractor evoked auditory response which suggests that this effect is not a purely uh, domain specific sensory effect, but it's rather a domain general effect. And it might even be that uh, similar, um, similar regions would, would be found to host such, a, such an endogenous rhythm, for example, in the visual modality. After this finding, uh, Troby followed up on that and we, we reasoned that if the neural system hosts a, a, a rhythmic fluctuation of distractibility, then maybe this rhythmic fluctuation of distractibility could be entrained if we present rhythmic or arrhythmic distractors. Uh, I will only briefly present that because um, 
that is a whole line of experiments and it mostly showed null results, to be honest. Um, but I think it's interesting to look at that because we used a very similar task paradigm. Again, it's an irrelevant speech task. And during the distracted retention period, we either presented participants with a temporarily regular sequence of tones and they were um, each two tones were 250 milliseconds apart. So that's a four hertz rhythm. Or we presented a four hertz rhythm, but the very final tone shown here in blue is out of phase, right? So the final tone could either be in phase or out of phase. And the question was, would such an out of phase condition be more distracting compared to an in phase condition? So would, would this distractibility be entrainable over time? And the short answer is no, not very much. So in this experiment, we found no effect. Uh, the temporally regular stream was not more or less distracting than the other streams. And also we followed up on that in, in a whole series of other experiments where we use different kinds and, and different frequencies for our temporally regular and irregular distractors, but we did not find strong effects. There were some effects on the more metacognitive uh, outcome variables. So for example, response speed. In one of the experiments, we found that regular distractors uh, made participants respond faster compared to irregular distractors. But uh, most of the effects of, of uh, temporal regularity of distractors on accuracy were either absent or, or very small. So that means that effects of temporal regularity of distraction on response behavior are quite limited. And um, that basically indicates that the neural system hosts an endogenous rhythm. Distractibility fluctuates over time, but this fluctuation of distractibility seems to be not very vulnerable to external stimulation. So external stimulation cannot easily entrain this endogenous rhythm of distractibility. Okay, so to finish the first part of the talk, we have seen that distractibility is a highly dynamic process over time and it fluctuates on a sub-second time scale, roughly at, at uh, three to five hertz. In the second part of the talk, I would like to focus on the second dimension along which attention and distractor suppression is dynamic. And that is the suppression of distraction in space. And first of all, I would like to introduce a neural signature, a very prominent neural signature that is related to attention. And that is the power of alpha oscillations at a frequency of roughly 10 Hertz. So here we see one of the very first uh, reports of the relationship between attention and alpha oscillations in the literature. That's from 1944. And we see EEG activity and Adrian had the participants switch attention from the visual to the auditory modality. And whenever participants did that, these rhythmic bursts in activity emerged in the EEG. And these are alpha oscillations with a frequency of roughly 10 Hertz. So we can quantify this, the size of these alpha oscillations as squared amplitude or alpha power. Uh, we can color code that. So usually higher power corresponds to the warmer colors in, in the plots that I will show later on. And here's a more recent finding from the pastors and colleagues where they recorded um, ECOG data. So directly from the cortical surface during an auditory task. And we see that during an auditory task, alpha power relatively increases in non-auditory regions and it decreases in auditory regions. So that basically indicates that alpha oscillations uh, potentially have an inhibitory function, right? And all those brain areas which are not task relevant are inhibited. And the brain region that is task relevant, which is the auditory cortex in an auditory task, is, is not inhibited. So here is a typical paradigm from our, uh, from our group that we use to study uh, the modulation of these uh, alpha oscillations in spatial attention paradigms. 
again, we present our participants with, with numbers. You see that we, we like numbers as stimuli because they are very handy in our experiments. And in this paradigm, we present them simultaneously on the left and right ear. Uh, with different numbers and participants either have to attend left and ignore right or vice versa. And in the end of a trial, they are presented with such an array of numbers and they have to pick those numbers from the array, uh, which they think appeared on the to be attended side. And in the response behavior, we see that they perform quite well. So most of their responses are hits, but importantly, there are also quite a few spatial confusions, which means participants pick the numbers from the competing stream. And these systematic errors, these spatial confusions are more frequent than random errors. A random error would be picking a number that was not presented during the trial at all. So again, this difference uh, between systematic and unsystematic errors is important to, uh, to, to, to show that the distractor was indeed distracting. Theoretically, what we would expect to happen in the brain are two mechanisms at the same time. Because we present a target on the one side and the distractor on the other side, we would expect that the neurosystem, the brain, hosts a mechanism to facilitate processing of the target and another mechanism that inhibits the distractor. Right, And because the auditory system is contralaterally organized, which means that input to the right ear is preferentially represented in the left hemisphere and vice versa, we would expect that these um, processes, the facilitation and the inhibition show up in the two hemispheres uh, so that they show up as a, as a kind of lateralized effect. And we can measure um, these lateralized effects in the EEG or MEG. In this case, it was an MEG study that we uh, published in 2016. And this shows nicely that we find exactly that. So when we quantify the size of these alpha oscillations while participants perform a spatial attention task of this kind, we see exactly this pattern. So contrasting attend left with attend right trials gives us higher alpha activity in the left hemisphere and lower alpha activity in the right hemisphere. So that means that where whenever we shift our attention in space to the left side, uh, our alpha power increases in the left and decreases in the right hemisphere. So this is just a topographic map looking at, 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 at the scalp from the top. We can also source localize that uh, to, to determine the, uh, the neural contributions to this effect. And if we do that, we find that mostly occipital parietal regions, but also auditory cortex regions contribute, right? Especially here on the right, but also on the left side, we see in the temporal lobe that also auditory cortex regions contribute to this effect. So this is an interesting effect. It seems like we have uh, we have discovered something like a, a neural filter mechanism of attention. Um, but the question is whether these lateralized alpha oscillations are functionally relevant for spatial attention. So very often um, we show correlations only. And also this plot, for example, shows a very striking correlation, but it's just a correlation. So when we divide performance in the spatial attention task into trials where participants perform correct, so where they make four hits, or into trials where they make errors, uh, errors, um, incorrect trials with less than four hits, we see that there is a very strong difference in the hemispheric lateralization of alpha power. So this attentional modulation is much stronger and correct compared to incorrect trials. However, this does not necessarily mean that the difference in alpha lateralization is the reason for the performance difference. And in order to test this, this functional relevance, we can use uh, brain stimulation. So in this case, we use transcranial alternating current stimulation. And the, the basic rationale is that we do not measure uh, alpha oscillations with an EEG, but instead we stimulate participants' brains with alpha oscillations in order to see whether this stimulation has an effect on performance. 
And in this study, we, we uh, for practical reasons, we decided to, to stimulate one of the two hemispheres and we stimulated the left hemisphere as we see in this uh, plot here on the lower right. So we stimulated participants' brains, why they performed this spatial attention task, and we stimulated them with two different frequencies. So one was alpha, that's the obvious one. This is also what we found in the previous studies. And as I said, the role of alpha, the, the hypothesized role of alpha is inhibition in attention. And as a control frequency, as an antagonist, uh, we used gamma oscillations with uh, frequency uh, above 40 Hertz. And the rationale was that in the literature, it's typically reported that these two frequency bands are anti-correlated. So that means whenever alpha power is low, gamma power is high and vice versa. So that means that the, the hy hypothesized role of gamma oscillations is rather facilitation than inhibition. So the effects of the two should also go in opposite directions. So on this slide, I would like to uh, highlight to, to to visually display the hypotheses we had because it's a it's a it's a bit of a complicated paradigm, but I think if I guide you through this this uh, slide, it's 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 not so difficult uh, to to understand what our hypotheses were. So what I show here in the middle is uh, the proportion correct for conditions where participants were stimulated versus sham. And sham in these uh, experiments means that participants think they are stimulated, but the stimulator is switched off. Um, so let's start here. If we stimulate participants with alpha oscillations on the left hemisphere, this should, in theory, inhibit the input to the right ear. And in an attend left trial, the right ear input is a distractor. So that means in such a condition, performance should uh, benefit from the stimulation. So this is why this blue dot is moving above zero. However, in an attend right trial, the opposite would happen. Alpha stimulation on the left hemisphere would now inhibit a right ear target. And if the target is inhibited, performance would go down. So this is the effect that we would expect for the alpha stimulation condition. For gamma stimulation, we would expect the opposite effect. So if we stimulate with gamma on the left hemisphere in an attend left trial, then the right ear distractor would be facilitated. And facilitating the distractor is not a good thing. So performance goes down. However, in an attend right trial, left hemispheric stimulation with gamma would facilitate the right ear target and performance would go up. So this is a schematic um, of, of the hypotheses we had and what, what we would expect if these alpha and also gamma oscillations are functionally relevant uh, for spatial attention performance. And the actual results fit quite well to these hypothesized effects. So as you can see, they go into opposite directions, into uh, the directions that we hypothesized. And most importantly, the interaction between the alpha effect in blue and the gamma effect in pink is uh, highly significant. So that means that these alpha oscillations are indeed functionally relevant for auditory spatial attention. And the nice thing is that this basic finding has also been shown in other modalities and it also has been replicated in the auditory modality in recent years. So this is all very nice and interesting. However, there's one big problem we are having uh, in uh, spatial attention research in general, I think, and also in all the paradigms, in all the spatial attention paradigms that I presented before, because we, we very often confound uh, target and distractor features in attention research. And this is also happening in our spatial attention studies. So probably you have realized that on every trial in such a spatial attention paradigm, whenever the target is on the left side, the distractor is on the right side and vice, vice versa. So these two are 100% confounded. And if we find a hemispheric lateralization of alpha power and think that this is a neurofilter mechanism of attention, we do not know whether this neurofilter mechanism of attention is driven by target enhancement or by distractor suppression, or both. 
And we have this problem in the auditory modality and very similarly uh, in the visual modality. Uh, these hemispheric lateralizations of alpha power are most often observed in paradigms where the spatial locations of target and distractor are confounded to some extent. So we tried in one study to decouple target versus distractor suppression. Um, and it was a simple paradigm. So participants were faced with two loudspeakers in the room and they got a spatial cue from one of the two loudspeakers. Um, so one of the two loudspeakers made a noise, basically. And a little later, the loudspeaker played a tone sequence and participants had to indicate whether this tone sequence was increasing or decreasing in pitch. So is it going up or down? And at the same time, the other loudspeaker would also play a tone sequence and that could either also go down or up or uh, so it could be congruent or incongruent with the target uh, tone sequence. And in such a paradigm, if we record uh, the EEG, we see that the strongest uh, alpha power, the strongest um, amplitude, the highest amplitude of alpha oscillations occurs here in the interval in between the spatial cue and the onset of these tones. And this is also the, the time interval where we typically look at these um, hemispheric lateralizations of alpha power. The trick uh, we used in this paradigm was basically to decouple target processing and distracted processing by the arrangement of the two loudspeakers. And in order to study this uh, target processing, irrespective of distracted processing, we fixed the distractor in the front. So the distracting loudspeaker was always in the front and the target loudspeaker was sometimes presented on the left and sometimes on the right. So we had select left and select right conditions and the distractor was always in the front. It was fixed. To study distractor suppression, we just did the opposite. We fixed the target in the front and we varied the distractor. Sometimes it was on the right side, sometimes on the left. So we had suppress left and suppress right trials. Target performance uh, did not differ so much across these two setups. So we see performance for correct and incongruent, um, for congruent and incongruent conditions. Uh, participants perform better if the two tone sequences were both going up or both going down in the congruent condition. Um, however, in the incongruent condition and particularly in those conditions where the target was in the front, participants performed a bit worse. Most importantly, uh, we looked in the EG uh, at the hemispheric lateralization of alpha power for these two different scenarios for the lateral processing of targets versus the lateral processing of distractors. For the targets, we found the typical hemispheric lateralization of alpha power. This is pretty much what I've shown before. Probably it's also not very surprising that if we remove the, the lateral effect of the distractor by keeping it fixed in the front, we still find the hemispheric lateralization of alpha power that is known from the literature. However, more important was the question of whether this lateralization of alpha power would now flip around, it would flip in polarity if we present lateral distractors instead of lateral targets. And that was actually the case. So as you can see, the hemispheric lateralization of alpha power flips around. Um, the effect is smaller than the effect of uh, lateral target processing. But you can see that it uh, that is pretty, pretty much uh, a reversal of polarity that we see over here. So basically that means that the neural system hosts two mechanisms, one for lateral target processing and one for lateral uh, distractor processing. And an obvious question if we find two mechanisms on the neural level is, how do they relate to each other, right? Is it that target selection and distractor suppression on the neural level are two mechanisms that are, that are strongly linked to each other or are they largely independent? And there are different ways to test that and two ways are shown down here. And I think they both speak to the two being not very strongly related. So on the left side, we see a simple uh, scatter plot for a correlation between the two and uh, distractor suppression on the Y, target selection on the X axis. And as you can see in the pattern, there's no simple linear relationship between the two. Um, and 
actually the base factor even speaks to the null hypothesis. So it speaks to the absence of an effect. Um, so it, it indicates there is no strong relation. And on the right, we see a, a contrast of the two effects on the brain level. Um, so for each voxel, we can calculate whether the effect of suppression is stronger than selection or vice versa. And we see that these two processes happen also in distinct and in different uh, cortical regions, right? Uh, where here in, in more anterior right hemispheric regions, uh, suppression effects are stronger and in more posterior regions, the selection effects dominate. So that basically means that there is no very obvious and no strong relation between the two, which in turn means that the two are largely independent. So that is also the most the most important take-home message of the second part of the talk, I guess. Uh, the neural system hosts these two uh, kind of attentional filter mechanisms, and one of them is related to target enhancement, the other to distract the suppression, and the two are largely independent of each other. So in the last part of the talk, I would like to focus on individual differences of subjective versus objective hearing and noise. And uh, to motivate that a bit, I would like to show you how, how much subjective ratings or subjective evaluations of hearing and noise differ. Um, and these are results from the so-called acceptable noise level task. That's a, that's a nice uh, psychoacoustic task where participants listen to snippets of an audiobook. And while they do that, they can adjust the noise level. And they have three tasks. So they have to adjust the noise level to a level that is not distracting, just acceptable, or clearly distracting. And usually this, this just acceptable level in the middle, this is, this is the main outcome measure of the acceptable noise level task. And uh, we did this experiment in a relatively large sample of participants, more than 1,000 in, in an online study. And you can see the distributions of the different, um, of the different ratings or of the different SNR adjustments that participants made here. Uh, but the most important point is that these are highly overlapping, right? And also, if we zoom in onto individual participants, we can see very different patterns. So for some individuals, these three levels, not distracting, just acceptable, clearly distracting, are very close to each other. And for others, they are really far apart. So there's huge variability. And this variability remains to large extents, even if we regress out audiological factors or demographic information like age, gender, education, all of these uh, demographic uh, variables that might be relevant here. So basically the, the, the punchline here is that there is very large variability uh, in hearing in noise or in noise sensitivity in the population. And one important goal for the, for the auditory neuroscience, I think, is to, to explain these uh, inter-individual differences. Interestingly, if we look in the literature, um, we find that not only audiological factors and demographic factors, but also personality can explain some of these differences uh, in noise tolerance, particularly so the subjective differences in noise tolerance. However, um, this might also be due to the fact that the way we measure noise tolerance and the way we measure personality are not totally independent. So if we look at typical items from questionnaires from big five inventories that are used to measure um, the personality dimensions, neuroticism or extraversion, something like I am someone who worries a lot or I am someone who is talkative. Uh, and we look at typical questionnaires that are used to measure noise sensitivity something like the Weinstein noise sensitivity scale, which uses the item, I get annoyed when my neighbors are noisy. We see that these, these items, they all tap into the, the effective evaluation of noisy situations or of general situations, right? Um, 
And this might also explain why we find uh, a strong relation between these measures of, uh, of subjective noise tolerance or noise sensitivity and uh, personality dimensions, neuroticism and extraversion. And in the present study, we wanted to, um, to not only assess the subjective measures of noise tolerance, but also objective measures, right? We wanted to get both uh, both sides, basically. So we conducted an online study with, as I said, more than 1,000 participants spanning a large age range, 18 to 74 years. We did a short personality inventory and we performed three subjective hearing and noise tests, which were basically uh, the Weinstein noise sensitivity scale, SSQ, which are just questionnaires, and this acceptable noise level test that I imp uh, introduced earlier. And we also performed an objective hearing and noise test, which was a psychoacoustic test where participants had to had to uh, in, uh, had to attend to uh, digits, spoken digits presented in noise, and it was an adaptive test that determined the threshold, the SNR threshold that participants required to understand fifty percent of these uh, of these uh, digits that were presented. So on this slide, in this figure, um, I, I summarize the results. And what we see are standardized regression coefficients of linear models. Um, and the factors are shown here on the side. These are the personality dimensions plus age. And the, the different outcome measures are shown in the four columns. And we can focus on neuroticism and extraversion, as these turned out to be also the most important um, predictors in, in previous research. And um, replicating previous studies, we find that higher levels of neuroticism predict lower noise resistance in this Weinstein noise sensitivity scale, uh, also in the SSQ and also in the ANL test. But interestingly, the objective performance difference uh, or the objective performance of participants who score high on neuroticism rather shows a, a slight increase, right? And for extraversion, the pattern goes pretty much in, in the opposite direction. So to highlight this digit triple test performance, which was our objective test of, of noise tolerance or noise sensitivity, uh, here are the results. As I said, it's an adaptive test, which means that it starts at a relatively uh, easy uh, signal to noise ratio and then participants perform typically correct on a few trials and then the, the task converges on an SNR where they are still able to perform correct with 50%. And if we divide our sample into participants with high and low neuroticism, we see that the high, uh, the, 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 the participants who score high on neuroticism, they perform better on average. So they reach uh, thresholds of lower SNR, which means they can, they can still perform the task even when it's more difficult. So if we want to summarize these results in a way that we uh, put participants into a two-dimensional space and, and contrast their subjective and objective um, hearing and noise abilities, we can simply do that because we now have objective and subjective tests of hearing and noise, right? The objective test is our digit triple test shown here on the x-axis. And the subjective test is, for example, the, the ANL. And we can show individual participants as these dots. And all the participants that are on the diagonal, um, they have a matching subjective and objective noise tolerance. And those participants who, 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 are, uh, who are going away from the diagonal, basically, they are either overrating or underrating uh, their objective noise tolerance. And now we can color code these, these clouds of dots by different uh, factors. Let's maybe start down here with H. I think this is a very intuitive effect that we all might know. So if participants get older, uh, you see that the hotter colors move to the left here. So objective noise sensitivity uh, increases or put differently, objective noise tolerance decreases. So participants perform worse in noisy situations if they get older, objectively. However, subjectively on the y-axis, there's not much happening. So this, this little arrow pointing left 
shows basically the, the center of gravity of this dot cloud, showing that participants uh, move a lot on the x-axis on the objective uh, hearing a noise, but subjectively at an older age, uh, there's not much change in the hearing and noise abilities. And now the same for neuroticism and extraversion. We see that participants move to the upper left um, for, for extraversion or to the lower right for neuroticism. So that basically means they, um, they decrease in their subjective, but they increase in their objective noise sensitivity. Um, which is also summarized in, in this figure, which shows it all together, I guess. Um, so basically, we have these, these three important um, factors that move participants away from the diagonal. As I said, higher levels of extraversion explain that participants overrate their hearing and noise. Higher levels of neuroticism correlate with underrated hearing and noise. And older age correlates with decreasing objective but relatively stable subjective ratings of hearing and noise. So I guess what this shows is that personality captures these dissociations of subjective versus objective hearing and noise. And it's it's important to, to, to capture these differences if we want to understand why in, in real life some participants, some people are more distracted by noise than others or why some people feel more distracted by noise than others. Okay, so before concluding, I would like to go back to one of the very initial slides that I presented, which was this one. Um, where I presented the two paradigms that are often used in the auditory and visual modalities to study distraction. And the point I would like to make in the end is that these two paradigms and other related paradigms that we use, they are, they are uh, very helpful to study distraction in the lab. But to be honest, distraction in real life is different. And one important future direction that I would like to highlight and what I think is important in future is to study distractor suppression through attention and action. So I think it's important that we focus on the action side um, because very often in our laboratory experiments, participants are not allowed to move. And particularly in spatial attention studies, it's important to capture systematic movements of participants, head and body rotations, uh, which they can also use in order to solve a listening challenge. So recently, uh, we have convened with a, with a group of authors and, and, and published this uh, 10 simple rules to study distractor suppression um, article. And as the title says, there are 10 simple rules to study distractor suppression, we think. <laughs> And uh, the last rule uh, I would like to highlight here, because this is, this is important in the context of action. And this rule says, consider distraction in the lab versus in the real world. And I think this is exactly uh, what, we, what we have to do in the future. And just to give you a very bit of a flavor of what this might look like. So here's an example from, from one recording of just one participant who during such a spatial attention task was wearing an EEG cap that also included a gyroscope. So it's a mobile EEG cap that also includes a gyroscope that records head movements. And um, when our participant had to attend to the left or ignore right or uh, perform whatever kinds of, of spatial attention tasks, you can see in these plots down here that our participant systematically rotated the head. So for example, when there was a target on the left side, the participant tended to rotate the head also to the left, which could be considered target enhancement. And here on the right, you can see that when participants or when this participant was facing a distractor on the left side, the participant turned the head right away from the distractor, which could be considered a, a, behavioral, um, a behavioral way of suppressing a distractor by head rotation. And I think in future, it will be relevant to capture these behavioral filter mechanisms of attention in addition to the neural filter mechanisms of attention that we typically capture in the laboratory and to study them in combination 
in order to understand these intricate uh, dynamics of attention and distractor suppression. So with these remarks on future directions, I would like to thank you very much for your attention. And I'm happy to discuss, answer questions, uh, whatever you feel like. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That was fascinating. Um, we have a question in the Q&A right now. I'll just remind everyone in the audience, go ahead and type in your questions that you have in the Q&A. So while we're waiting for others to put in questions, the first question that came in around the middle of the talk, which I think is pretty related to, to what you were talking about at the end, um, is from Max Schultz, who asks, how is attention slash distraction sensitivity distributed in three-dimensional space? Are humans more sensitive to spatial distractors that are, for example, right in front compared to the back? Or are there differences between single dimensions in space? For example, azimuth, elevation, or distance? Yeah, that's a that's a very good question. And I have to admit, with our data, I think we can only very partially answer this question. Um, but the, the simple answer is yes, it makes a difference. But um, the combination of the two sound sources is important. So the combination of where is the target and where is the distractor. And one thing that we find uh, in, in, in our experiments, which is maybe intuitively surprising, is that usually there is a preference uh, when we listen to the left or right compared to listening to something that is in the front. Um, so if we have a, a, a target on the left or right side, um, there, the performance is better compared to having a target on the right side, uh, on the, in the front, when at the same time we have distractors present. Another effect that we find, and that depends on the kind of stimulus material we use, is a left or a right ear advantage. So that's uh, something that is very well known in audiological research, is that when we use speech as a stimulus material, which we sometimes do, uh, we have a right ear advantage. So participants perform better if they listen with their right compared to their left ear. Uh, however, if you perform something like a pitch discrimination task, it turns around and it becomes a left ear advantage. So uh, it, it, basically the answer is it's complicated and it varies along many dimensions. Um, but I think... Uh, the combination, I think I think the clue to study that in the future is also to use uh, a, a rich parametric variation of different uh, combinations of sound sources in in space uh, to 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 develop such a such a three-dimensional pattern of how uh, how distraction varies in three-dimensional space. Okay. And while we're waiting for more questions to come in, if there are any, I'll ask a question. So at the end, you were talking about individual differences and, and primarily in personality. You mentioned uh, cognitive factors that might explain noise tolerance. Can you talk a bit more about what some of those factors are? For example, does working memory capacity play a role? Yeah, yeah. Actually, working memory capacity is... is uh probably one of the of the most relevant candidates when it comes to cognitive factors. Uh, and indeed, it has been shown that in these speech and noise tasks, uh, particularly when it comes to those uh, levels of sound presentation and those SNR levels, which are really challenging, uh, larger working memory capacity explains better performance to some extent. Uh, and also from audiological research, there's some evidence from, from Thomas Luna and others that, that even the kinds of, of signal processing that is used in hearing aids maybe relates to cognitive capacity. So individuals with higher working memory capacity, they might benefit from other signal processing in hearing aids compared to people with lower working memory capacity. So working memory capacity is definitely... Uh, one one of the of the key factors here. Um, it is it is a bit bit of a question in in our research uh, in in how far general attention abilities uh, 
Um, so supramodal attention abilities uh, play a role. So usually we measure auditory attention in our auditory attention paradigms. But in the end, very often it's a question of whether participants who, who show uh, certain distraction effects in the auditory modality, whether they would relate or transfer to the visual modality, for example. So I think we need we need research and future to understand how these effects, how these dynamics of distraction translate between individual modalities or how modality specific they are. Okay. Uh, we have another question from an anonymous attendee who says, thank you for your amazing talk. I wanted to ask, do you think that musical training affects attention slash distraction sensitivity? That's a good question. I mean, training in general is an, is an important uh, factor, potentially. Um, what we see in experiments, so if we do these pitch discrimination experiments, for example, and um, we have musicians and non-musicians participating in our sample, uh, usually the musicians outperform the non-musicians. I think that's not very surprising. And this is also part of the reason why very often in these uh, auditory attention paradigms, we have to titrate task performance individually so that every participant uh, in the end performs around 50 or 70% correct. Um, training effects, and we, we don't study training effects in our group. However, uh, we sometimes see training effects in the data. So when we look at uh, how participants perform over the course of, of an experiment, they sometimes get better during the experiment, during the first 20, 30 minutes or so, and then they usually reach a plateau. However, what is known from the literature is that certain aspects of these um, attention effects uh, can, can be trained, of course, but the question is always how, how well does it translate to other, if, uh, to, uh, to other paradigms, to other situations. And uh, the training effects are there, but sometimes the translation effects are rather small. So it means that, well, training, Training makes sense and training uh, uh, can be very effective, but I would not expect that the trans translational effects of the training are are very large. Uh, so it, it it depends a bit. Yeah. Okay. Jessica Alexander asks, given the endogenous distractibility rhythm you've described, have you done any investigations of speech perception in which the syllabic rate is varied? That is, is the speech at different rates more or less susceptible to distraction or to being distracting? That's a that's a cool idea, actually, because the syllabic rate is pretty close to the the, the frequency that we find for our distractibility uh, dynamics, which is also around uh, three, four, five hertz. Um, we have not done research in this direction. So uh, what 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 we have uh, considered doing in a future experiment and i think is what what's what's the next step that would be necessary is to understand whether in how far these temporal dynamics in distractibility that we found and the temporal dynamics in attentional processing that are very apparent in the in the recent literature in how far they are driven by a, a similar underlying mechanism so that will be a, a topic of future studies i guess um, but it's an, it's an important question. It's an interesting question of how, how this effect that we found for a, uh, for a pitch discrimination task where no speech whatsoever was presented, how these findings would translate to a situation where we present uh, more ecologically valid stimuli in real world, which would be speech uh, at, a, at, a, at a certain uh, frequency, for example, three hertz versus four or five hertz, or in versus out of phase with the endogenous uh, distractibility uh, rhythm. So at the moment, I can only speculate, but it would be very interesting uh, to study that in the future. All right, Patrick Lemaire asks, regarding individual differences, could objective and subjective tolerance to distraction interact with people's expertise in a cognitive domain? For example, could noise while performing a math task distract less for a math expert? More generally, how does domain-specific expertise interact with domain-general distractibility? 
it's a it's a good point i mean probably it will depend on 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 expertise um actually in the uh, the, the study that we performed on the relation of subjective versus objective hearing and noise was an online study so we do not have perfect control about what participants are doing and how they how exactly they are solving the task and there are different um, potential explanations that that might be relevant to test in, in in future experiments also and and one hypothesis is that those participants who score higher on neuroticism they show this slight increase in objective performance because they invest more effort they they are not per se better in 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 their audiological capacity or in their audiological processing but they just try harder so to say right uh, that might be one interpretation another interpretation which we try to rule out but it's very difficult is that um, maybe those participants who score higher on neuroticism they equip themselves at home with better sound presentation hardware, <laughs> which is uh, something that might happen and that might uh, play into these results. We try to control that and, and the results look like this is this is not a relevant factor, but just in theory, uh, that that might be, um, might be a relevant thing to, to consider. And also expertise uh, is, is, is a, a relevant factor, I think. So it very much depends on, on the task that we are doing. And if we are doing a task that we are very good at, um, maybe the subjective noise tolerance decreases, but objectively, um, it doesn't change, right? So I think uh, when when we present these results uh, to audiologists, they tend to say, yes, of course, this is what we observe every day in in the clinic. We have our our patients, and they, for example, get a cochlear implant or a hearing aid, and after a month, they come back and they say. I, I I can't hear very well. The device doesn't work. So subjectively, they report that it doesn't work. And then the audiologist does an objective test. But sometimes the objective test is showing that they perform great. And sometimes it's also the other way around. So I think for us as experimental psychologists, these results are somewhat surprising. But from the uh, from the practical side, uh, from 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 the work of audiologists, I think they they confirm that this is happening. Uh, in the clinic, in in, in everyday life, um, so that is interesting to see, and I think that confirms that this is a, a relevant factor when we move into these more close to real life situations. Also, mm -hmm. that makes sense. All right, sorry, Kim says thank you for the great talk. There have been arguments that cast doubt on the functional role of alpha related to suppression. They assumed that alpha could be more like tracking spatial representations and enhance them rather than suppressing distractors. I'm wondering how you think about this new view about alpha. Thanks a lot. Yeah, actually, if you look in the literature, I mean, alpha seems to be related to many different cognitive processes and not only cognitive processes, but also oculomotor processes and, and movement preparation. So I would not be surprised, for example, if in future we move into a paradigm where participants can use their head rotations, their body rotations to solve a spatial listening challenge, uh, whether in such uh, a situation, uh, all kinds of hemispheric lateralizations of alpha power show an entirely different dynamic or the effects that we know from our typical laboratory studies, they disappear to some extent. So I think some of the effects that we see in alpha lateralization and alpha modulation in the brain are very specific uh, to those experimental paradigms that we are using. But we are using these paradigms also for good reason, because they, they offer a nice experimental control. But I think, as I said in the end, I think it's time to move to more close to real life experiments in order to find uh, how these effects uh, generalize across across different domains and whether alpha is related to distractor suppression or not uh, whether it's a more uh, general uh, factor a more general process that, that that modulates the gain or modulates the the sensitivity it's 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 uh, it's a really difficult question and i think it in the laboratory, as I said, it depends on the on the very task design we are using. Uh, 
And in, in real life situations, it could turn out that the dynamics are different. Right. Well, I think you've answered everybody's questions. Um, oh, no, nope. <laughs> one just came in uh, again from uh, Sorry Kim and, and then someone else. So you're not done yet. Uh, Sorry Kim says, one more thing if time allows. I wanted to ask is also if you have any plans to see the relations with exogenous orientation of attention. Like you said in the last part, we need to think about distractors in a more practical way. And usually distractors are abrupt and intense, so automatically capture our attention strongly. Yeah, right. Um, I think this this also very much relates to, to what I presented towards the end of the talk, because usually in our experiments, what we do is we present a relatively large number of trials to get clean data. But that also means that we present participants with targets and distractors five, six, seven hundred times during an hour or one and a half. So that means there is some statistical learning going on. Over time, they learn features about the targets and distractors, and they might use these distractor templates uh, that they build up over time more strongly uh, towards the, the end of an experiment compared to the beginning, for example. And um, we have not done that systematically, but that's definitely... Uh, on the list, basically, to play around with the statistical um, features um, of, of, of the distractors over time um, to, to manipulate, for example, that on, on many trials uh, in succession, the distractor is showing up on the right side. And then participants would, would build up an expectation that for the next trial, it would also show up on the right side. And this is, this is I think, also what is happening in, in, in real life sometimes, that you have an expectation that is built up over time. Um, and then this expectation is, is violated or, or confirmed by the incoming uh, stimulus. So these these kinds of effects, I think, uh, are are important to to analyze and to incorporate in future uh, experiments of these kind. Okay, we have another question in the Q and A, and I'll just shout out to all the attendees. We have time, so please go ahead and feel free to type any of the questions that you still have in the Q and A. So this is from an anonymous attendee. I'm curious whether the participant's sensitivity to stimuli being synchronized or unsynchronized in terms of audiovisual integration could also be influenced by attention slash distraction sensitivity. That's an interesting hypothesis. <laughs> I must admit, we, we never thought about testing that. Usually in our experiments, we try very hard to uh, make targets and distractors perceptually appear at the same moment in time. So for example, when we present these, these numbers on the left and right side simultaneously, we typically uh, manipulate uh, the, the the perceptual onsets of these numbers in a way that we shift them in time and put them on top of each other so that the acoustic onsets are slightly apart that to 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 make sure the perceptual onsets are on top of each other so that subjectively it sounds very much like they are happening at the at the exact same time and they are very difficult to separate whether attention or distraction uh, has an has an impact on this on this temporal integration uh, it's an interesting hypothesis, but as I said, I must admit we we did not uh, study that uh, so far. Um, so we'll we'll be put on the list for future studies. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I don't currently see any more questions. I'm drawing out this sentence to give anybody that last little bit to finish their sentence and. Uh, hit enter in case one is about to happen. But seeing none, are there any uh, last minute sort of take home messages that you would like to give everyone? Well, if if I if I would have to 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 give a take home message or summarize uh, the the whole talk in a few sentences, I would I would like to emphasize. Uh, the necessity of of really moving to closer to real life uh, experiments, because I think 
these days it's also possible and feasible uh, and it's not so difficult as we as we sometimes think particularly in the auditory modality uh, it's very simple to to measure participants body movements while they perform an experiment yeah. uh, and it's also relatively simple to uh, present sounds not over headphones but from speakers arranged in the room in a certain uh, fashion so that would be a very first very small step to a closer to real life situation and if we do that and if we take further steps then i think we can we can learn a lot and we can learn how uh, how if and how what we find in the laboratory really translates to the real world and i think that's that's important for the future of not only auditory neuroscience but maybe particularly so Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. That was a fascinating talk. And thank you to all the One World attendees. Please join us next month, March 27th. Danny Oppenheimer will be speaking about cognitive science in the age of augmented cognition. Thank you, everyone. Goodbye.